The Office is an American sitcom classic. It has one of the largest and most devoted fan bases of any television series ever created. It launched the careers of dozens of talented actors and writers while cementing That's What She Said into popular culture for eternity. The show was a hit with critics as well, snagging 42 Emmy nominations and 5 wins over its 9 season run. Sure, Frasier had 107 nominations and 37 wins, but the Cheers spin-off about a psychiatrist turned radio show host doesn't hold the longevity and rewatchability of the Dunder Mifflin Scranton branch and its staff. But something happened to The Office over the years. The tone, style of comedy, and depiction of characters began to shift drastically, until it became something completely different than it was originally intended to be, like a warped funhouse mirror reflection of itself, an exaggerated caricature of what it once was. Sure, watching it still makes us happier than Stanley on Pretzel Day, but there's no denying the change. If you were to find somebody that had never watched the series, difficult as that may be, and were to show them season one, and season 9 back to back, they would feel like they were watching two entirely different shows. So how did that happen? And why? Well, spend that surplus money on a new chair and get comfy as we explore the flanderization of The Office. The term flanderization refers to the process in which a television character becomes consumed by a single personality trait, until that trait defines their persona entirely. Named after Homer's neighbor Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, whose entire character became nothing more than an over-the-top Christian stereotype. Flanderization is something that happens frequently in television, but The Office is one of the biggest perpetrators of this infamous TV trope, not only with its characters, but with the series as a whole. The pilot episode of the US version of The Office first aired on NBC in March of 2005. It was essentially a word-for-word -word remake of the pilot from the original UK version of The Office, an inside look at the workings of a small, failing paper supply company. There's office pranks, romance, and a lingering hatred for the mundane day-to-day -day routine of cold calls and faxes. That episode, and the entire first season, mostly went unnoticed and unwatched at the time of release. It was a drier type of humor, based on realistic scenarios and personalities reminiscent of people we've all met at one time or another. Everybody knows a Michael Scott, somebody who's conceited, has to be the center of attention and has zero social awareness. Those first few episodes center around things like a basketball game in the warehouse and a racial sensitivity seminar, things that would believably be occurring in the office. That believability was key to the early seasons of the show. The show's writers and producers, including Greg Daniels, who's adapted the series for American audiences, were determined to mimic the realism of a working office, to find the humor of daily life without grandiose gags or gimmicks. Pauses and quick cuts to phones ringing or papers printing were utilized between jokes to maintain the sense of a traditional day in the office. Slow moving and, well, dull. Season 1, Episode 4, The Alliance, finds Dwight paranoid of losing his job to potential layoffs. He strikes up an alliance with Jim, who pretends to go along with it, in order to perform one of his signature pranks. Together, Jim and Pam trick Dwight into hiding in a box in the warehouse, where he cuts holes into the cardboard to gain potentially sensitive information from his co-workers. According to the Office Season 1 DVD commentary track, the writing team was hesitant to include this scene. They feared it was too outlandish and too silly, and would contrast against the tone they were looking to achieve. Now, fast forward to this moment in season five. Oh, procedure, everyone. Calm. What's the procedure? Stay calm. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait, wait. Calm down! But we'll come back to that in a moment. There are three major turning points for the series, three major steps it takes towards the flanderized version of itself it would eventually become. The first occurs in season two. The writers realized that something had to change. Following the same comedic formula of the UK office wasn't going to translate to American audiences. Michael Scott, who is based off of David Brent from the original series, was too unlikable, too mean-spirited, and too out of touch with his workers. David Brent, played by the office creator Ricky Gervais, is a repugnant human being with very few, if any, redeeming qualities, Michael Scott would have to be something different. So, for season two, Michael Scott received a makeover. He was given better fitting clothes, his hair was changed from the thinning, gelled back monstrosity to a more typical and fitting look. This shift away from the character of David Brent and an overall lighter tone to season two was exactly what the series needed. Steve Carell was able to drift away from the character that Ricky Gervais had created and began to craft something unique. Angela Kinsey and Jenna Fisher, who played Angela and Pam in the series, spoke about the change on their podcast, The Office Ladies. Fisher said, I think they felt like when they got the pickup for season two, they could really make this for Steve. They could really base it more on what Steve was going to bring to the character. Michael's total disregard for other people's feelings was replaced with a childlike confusion. He wants to be a good person. He wants to be liked, loved even. But his awkward lack of boundaries or understanding of social norms makes that very 
very hard. That's what she said. For a few seasons, the series maintained this tone, not as dry as the UK series, carefully walking the middle ground between the mundane and the absurd, like a walk across hot coals on a beach day. And then this happened. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. Stress relief. This opening to the two-part episode shows the office in chaos. Panicked and frenzied as a fire set by Dwight as a test of the office's emergency preparedness sends smoke billowing into the workplace. It's a drastic divergence from the humor and behavior of the office workers in earlier seasons. In fact, we saw another fire in the office in a season two episode, aptly titled The Fire. In this episode, the comedy stems from Michael's response, sprinting for the exit and leaving everybody behind as he's determined to save himself. Everybody else simply walks in an orderly line out of the office and to the safety of the parking lot. Two different fires, two different seasons, two drastically different responses. Stress Relief showcases the second of three major turning points for the series. This is the moment that a series begins to lean into absurdity, drifting away from the realism of a modern office and embracing the freedom of a fictional setting. A cat is thrown into the ceiling, Kevin smashes a vending machine and steals the snacks inside, and Andy screams one of the most ridiculous lines in the entire series. The fire shooting at us! But Stress Relief is considered by many fans to be one of the series' best episodes. According to a poll conducted by Fandom Wire and the Office Addicts Facebook group, Stress Relief was voted the second best episode of the series, losing only to Dinner Party, which, let's be honest, is definitely the best episode, like hands down. But the silliness and pandemonium of that opening would become a staple of the series for the remainder of its seasons. Characters would become dumber. Nearly every line would be played for laughs. Character traits would be pushed to the extreme until that trait defined the character entirely. Take Kevin Malone, for example. Nope, it's not Ashton Kutcher. It's Kevin Malone. He began the series as a mostly quiet, slow-talking background character, nothing overtly distinct or outlandish. But by the end, his character would be whittled down to three main components, his voice, his weight, and his stupidity. The voice is the most prominent, turning into an exaggerated, gargled moan. We see it with Andy Bernard as well. The man who began as an ill-tempered, cocky, obnoxious salesman eventually becomes a clueless goofball with vibrant clothes, whose sales record was non-existent and whose cheerful smile and glib demeanor was a long way from punching a hole into the office wall. Even fan-favorite main characters like Dwight Schrute would fall victim to the flanderization of the office. Beginning the series as a brown-nosing, overzealous assistant to the regional manager, Dwight would become primarily defined by his beet farm and strange family traditions. It was in Season 2, Episode 3, Office Olympics, that we first learned about Dwight's beet farm. Used as a quick joke to explain why Dwight doesn't want to move into Michael's new condo with him, the beet farm would become a primary facet of the character's background. Background. So much so that a spin-off series, The Farm, was planned to follow Dwight and his life on the farm following the conclusion of The Office. A secret backdoor pilot episode was filmed as part of The Office's final season. However, NBC unsurprisingly decided to pass on that series. The most pivotal character of the series is undoubtedly Michael Scott. Steve Carell's masterful portrayal of the kind-hearted, dim-witted regional manager of Dundermuffin Scranton Branch is iconic. Michael Scott was The Office. And that's what made NBC's decision to continue the series after his his departure in Season 7, all the more confusing. Steve Carell leaving the cast of The Office is the third major turning point in the series. The show simply wasn't the same without his presence, and the quality dipped considerably. While Steve Carell initially stated he was leaving the series to spend more time with family, another version of events has been brought forward. Brian Baumgartner, who played Kevin Malone, hosts a podcast, An Oral History of The Office. Series producer Ben Silverman and editor Claire Scanlon spoke about the departure on the podcast, claiming that all cast members signed a standard seven-season contract at the beginning of the series. While most of the cast were renegotiating their contracts to continue for more seasons, NBC failed to approach Carell and his contract simply ended. Scanlon said this, I feel like NBC dropped the ball because I knew the story behind it which was they just never even bothered, which was just like so dumb. I don't know what was wrong with them. No matter the reason, the show floundered without Michael Scott, and the series was canceled shortly after. There's something magical about this show, something that keeps people coming back to it over and over again. In a way, the series itself is much like the Dunder Mifflin Scranton branch. It seemed destined to fail. It nearly did fail, but against all odds, it continued on, and its success grew beyond what anybody could ever have imagined. Sure, fans would love for more seasons of The Office, but it was while well, it lasted. I wish there was a way to know you were in the good old days before you actually left them. How many times have you watched The Office? And what did you think about the show's changes? Who's your favorite character? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to get more great content. Thanks for coming.